Talk Show. Recorded live. Hello, this is Michael Adams from Nothing But The Truth. It's January 29, 2015, and uh, we have another episode today of the Characteristics of the Antichrist, led by uh, York from uh, Juggler66, the YouTube channel, and uh, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Uh, but prior to the conversation starting, I'm going to read some of the headlines. Headline, it looks like number five. <clears throat> Pope Francis is carrying out a revolution. Huffington Post. Huffington Post has been posting a lot of uh, articles about this particular character. Um, the existing cardinals had been named bishops by John Paul II and Benedict XVI, and they were conservative and reactionary. Instead of one of the traditional people names, he took Francis, going on and on and on. So anyways, both Francis is carrying out a revolution, and that would be an interesting question in itself to look into. What is that revolution? Um, <clears throat> there's uh, quite a few articles uh, about the Mormon Church, of all things. Now that the political, the scenario of a, uh, the presidential election is coming up, uh, uh, they're ramping up the uh, attacks and awareness of the former Catholic Church, Los, Los Angeles Times. If judges can't join the Boy Scouts, what about the Mormons? To the editor of California's Supreme Court, unanimously decreed that state judges will no longer be allowed to affiliate with the Boy Scouts of America. Um, let's see, maybe a couple more. There, I think I'm going to focus on one more article, two more articles maybe. One thing is, is about the uh, Super Bowl. There's a lot of things about the Super Bowl. And I want to forewarn folks who listen to this show that uh, it will be a satanic ritual. The halftime for sure. We got Katy Perry, a self-proclaimed Satanist, that will be performing a satanic rite. And I just want to warn you: anyone who decides that they want to sit down and watch this with their loved ones and their children and their wives, that they might think twice about this. You might want to ask yourself: Why did they choose her, and why are they going to perform a satanic rite? You know, because things are getting stranger and stranger and more wicked and wicked, as you can imagine. Uh, the Catholic Church debate makes it stronger. Often Post, while Archbishop Caput, or Caput said such political labels are not useful or flawed, there is certainly a difference between the two men. Uh, more importantly, these uh, opposing views vindicate what may have been say, saying for years, and uh, I think this we might be, be talking about. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of turmoil right now in the Roman Catholic Church. So actually, I really don't know, and I don't want to open it up. But you can, certainly can. It's on Huffington Post. Uh, and um, let's see, one more, and I want to. There's a, a lot of news this week about Pope Francis addressing a uh, particular person. If I can find it. Now, all of a sudden, it's not there. Um, and if it's not, maybe we're not supposed to do that. But anyways, uh, Pope Francis supposedly has been having an uh, audience at the, in the Vatican with a transsexual. And I don't know what that is all supposed to mean and entail, but it certainly seems to be causing a lot of consternation within the church and certainly should raise our own eyebrows why the man who calls himself God and represented Jesus Christ is hanging out with a transsexual, someone who is confused about their own sexual identity and uh, has married his fiance. I don't know. Anyways, uh, with that, I'm going to close up this. It's pretty slow as far as articles go this this week. I think um, that's probably a good thing. So anyways, uh, what's going to have York? And Tom, York, how are you doing? I'm very fine, thank you. Did a lot of work the latest days uh, with my uh, with the latest video. Uh, as you know, and probably some of our listeners too, I'm uploading all these shows that we are doing here on uh, Talks Radio as a video on my YouTube channel. And uh, that does a lot of work, but it's so fulfilling. Uh, I'd rather do that than going to work and earn money, you know. <laughs> sure, I understand that completely. And Tom, how are you doing? 
I'm doing just fine, and nice to be with you both. Thank you for being with us. Okay, well, uh, we'll hand it over to you, York, and uh, it's, it's going to be interesting, folks. It's uh, I post on the the chat room the page and the chapter or point that we're doing. It's called the Antichrist and the men he controls will not have a desire for women. <clears throat> there you go. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we have been starting this some weeks ago, uh, making a broadcast on characteristics of Antichrist. And even though that I knew it was a long or big page on uh, www.remnantofgod.org on Nicholas' page, I have, would have never imagined that it would take us uh, up to now already eight broadcasts, uh, some of them even exceeding or going close to three hours in length. And we still only are at the 22nd, so I don't even think that this will be the last broadcast. And I surely don't hope it will be the last broadcast, because this is such an important, uh, such a vital to know subject uh, that we shouldn't cut cord on any, uh, short on anything of this. And I'm very glad that we again have today uh, Tom Fress from his website um, Inquisition Update, who is a veteran in doing radio shows uh, compared to Michael and me, of course, because we are doing this just uh, a few months now. But um, Tom Press has done this for years on First Men and Radio uh, and probably even other channels. And we very much appreciate that he is here. So I invite you uh, uh, again, very warm, Tom, to uh, join us here and give us your expertise and even going deeper into the explanation of these characteristics of Antichrist, which we will start today with uh, number 22. So, welcome, Tom. Hope everything is all right. And, yeah, come on. Nice nice to be here, and I'm, I'm anxious to contribute whenever the Lord leads. Appreciate it. And we appreciate it, absolutely your being here. This is um, such a wonderful fellowship that we have discovered here over the last months. And um, it's, it's so fulfilling for the people reading, you know. And, and just go back to the latest video that I uploaded yesterday. It was um, the externalization of the hierarchy part two, and that was the first time that Tom came on on this show also. Uh, so it went directly over three hours, of course. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I have had uh, a very nice response from uh, from a German uh, listener. I, forgot his name right now. Something. He ended with the number six. Uh, I don't know the number anymore. And he asked me, well, where are these broadcasts uh, taking place? And I, I, I told him tonight at eight o'clock, so maybe when he has time, he will join us in the chat room. Uh, anybody is always, uh, or everybody is always welcome to join us in the chat room, uh, ask some questions, or have uh, some, some fellowship with us. And uh, yeah, exactly. Also asking questions and, and take part, uh, or participate in the discussion that we are doing because sometimes it seems that, of course, we are not on the same point because we come from different backgrounds and uh, the one has studied longer than the other. And so, of course, there is sometimes here and there a gap to fill in and I guess that is also with our listeners. So, so I warmly welcome you all when you listen to this live for the first time and uh, if you only are able to download it afterwards, um, then you are also invited to participate because you can do that whether by contacting me on uh, the YouTube channel Juggler66 or you can do that by contacting Tom uh, and his email is tom at cwaves.us um, and in my latest uh, video this site is uh, blended in as a picture uh, including his email address and uh, he has no problem if you contact him with any serious questions. The only thing that we ask is that you are open to the truth. And uh, well, how can you say that uh, in, in other words? Tom found some uh, really good words how to, how to say that. I don't know if I have them standing here somewhere. Intellectual, intellectually, how, how did you put it, Tom? Intellectually honest. Intellectually yeah, honest. honest. Yeah, that's it. You have to be intellectually honest. <clears throat> and not to question the word of God. So... Just before I'm, I'm starting here, I want to tell a little story um, about uh, something that I counted yesterday for the first time and today for the second time. Um, probably some of you people know the YouTube channel of Adam1984. And uh, he started the discussion with me that um, the Bible 
is uh, written by men who had taken out some important books. He speaks about the book of Enoch. I answered to him, well, the Bible is the true word of God, and if God didn't want a book in there, that's why it is not in there. And if he says, well, man changed it, well, then it is not the word of God anymore. So he's going into discussion with me on that, even though that normally he is a King James uh, believer, I thought, up to now. But now he throws these things up there. And of course, uh, this is just one subject, but there can always be subjects where we differ on opinion. But I had to stand to my point and say, I personally review the Bible as the true word of God, and he made sure that uh, the King James Bible is preserved for people like us in the days that we are living in right now, that we can still study his true and righteous word, and that word consists of 66 books, and that does not include the book of Enoch, and that does not include the gospel of, uh, what is it, Phil, Philip, or, or, or whatever, there are some other books, maybe Tom, you can help me, you know, some of these uh, books that are probably not uh, published in the King James Bible, but in others. Yes, many apocryphal books. Uh, uh, many of them are included in the Roman Catholic Bible, which we don't acknowledge as the Word of God. Also, I, I'd like to make a comment that's pertinent to what you're what you're discussing here. Yeah, Nat- naturally, if if people can attack the Bible and bring into question its authenticity and its completeness, or any other criticism of the Bible, what is the natural end that they seek? It, it's to replace the Word of God, the Bible, with the Word of man. That has always been the case, and who is the man now dictating to the churches, to the governments of the world, what, will, what they will believe and what they will do and what they will think? It's the papacy. And every time there's an attack on the Bible, the end result is natural. The natural end result of the attack on the Bible is to literally replace it with the doctrines of men, the commandments of men. And so uh, I'm I'm afraid that, uh, you know, if someone writes to me, and brings into question the authenticity and the divine origin of the scriptures, uh, one is inviting me to a hostile discussion because I'm going to defend the Word of God. The King James Version of the Bible is the Word of God. And uh, uh, if someone suggests that the Bible is not complete, then they're simply suggesting that God wasn't able to compile his own book. And I reject that out of hand, and I think that ought to be the position uh, of of any Bible believer. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much. I was um, just looking this discussion up, uh, seeing if I can find it here, but a uh, little bit of problem with my with my browser and, and Firefox because I wanted to share the conversation that he started with me. But uh, uh, wait, it's opening now, but slowly. Yeah, of course. So what did I read earlier? Okay, he doesn't give it back to me. But he says here, I uh, know, oh that's, that's just what, what I said to him. Uh, he answered to me, the Bible is the word of God, but it's only 66 books. There's more books that the Protestants left out of the Bible when they put it together about 500 years ago. So, in that he states, obviously, that the King James Version is not the word of God in plain English, if you ask me. But uh, enough diversion from the subject that we were actually going to discuss. Um, point 22, or characteristic number 22, on the 26 points that we find on the wonderful website remnantofgod.org. If you haven't visited it now, I can very uh, warm advise you to go to that website and, uh, and study it because it's it's um, like there many people also on this board has already said it is if not the best uh, one of the absolute best websites of knowledge on uh, on the antichrist on uh, uh, on telling what the Roman Catholic Church is really all about on on the antichrist on, on uh, church history and all that stuff, and that's why we are reading here today, point 22, 
says, in short, Antichrist hates women or Antichrist men will be homosexual. Well, you can, of course, replace the word homosexual. Uh, with sodomites, Antichrist men will be sodomites. And um, that's exactly what this first point is dealing about. And uh, we start reading Daniel 11.37 that says, quote, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of woman, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify, magnify himself above all, end quote. Uh, may, I, may I stop and, and make a comment, Yerk? Please. Okay, this, this may seem a bit contradictory to the thrust of what Nicholas has put together here, where his focus is on uh, sodomy. Uh, sodomy naturally characterizes an idolatrous church. Okay, um, the Bible likens spiritual uh, fornication with with uh, sodomy, and the the, uh, the understanding of this comes from Romans chapter one, that those who make God into an image, a man-made image of wood or stone or gold or any other uh, man-made image uh, perverts God's body and blinds people to a true understanding of who God is. And if you continue reading in Romans chapter 1, you understand that God uh, issues a recompense for that sort of perversion. And that recompense is like for like. And so those who think themselves so wise as to reduce the incorruptible God into images, uh, uh, man-made images of four-footed beasts and birds and animals and creeping things, or images even of men, uh, that divine recompense is sodomy. And uh, this is why we see sodomy so prevalent in the Roman Catholic Church. I call it the Church of Sodomy. And uh, yeah, there's a global pedophile priest pandemic in the world. For instance, according to a BBC documentary, there are 4,500 cases in the courts of the United States against pedophile and homosexual priests in the Roman Catholic priesthood. But but if you'll if you'll just beg my pardon, I, I want to point something out about this scripture, Daniel chapter eleven, verse thirty seven. Listen carefully what it says. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. Okay? What we're talking about are so-called gods. This, this scripture is about so-called gods. And so the desire of women is also a god. Okay, and what was the god that was the desire of women? Every, every Jewish woman, every Hebrew woman, hoped to be the one to deliver the Christ child. I mean, the scriptures were clear that he would be born of a virgin. And for me, at least, and, and I don't mean to reduce what, what uh, Nicholas has put forward here, it's all relevant, but for me, uh, read in context, I believe this, this phrase, nor the desire of women, is a reference to Jesus Christ, the true God. And so with that caveat... Uh, I would just read it the way it uh, seems to make sense to me. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor Jesus Christ, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, now maybe, maybe I'm incorrect about this, but I just wanted to be on the record uh, before we begin our discussion, which is going to focus on uh, Roman Catholic Church hatred of women, Roman Catholic Church exploitation of women, Roman Catholic Church uh, uh, 
denigration of women and uh, and on and on. But uh, I, I hope this doesn't take away from the discussion. I just wanted to point that out uh, so so we might understand what what this is actually referring to. But go ahead, Gear. Yeah, I think that's a very important point that you just made, um, Tom. Uh, and we should really understand the last sentence of uh, Daniel 11:37, for he shall magnify himself above all. We are speaking about the Antichrist. We are speaking about Satan, who was in heaven, Lucifer, who magnified himself above God. That's what it's all about, right? Lucifer yeah, came to the way, earth. That's, that's Lucifer, the way I... Lucifer, yeah, Lucifer came to the world, and he still magnified himself above God. That's why in the first place he said to Eve, Hath God really said and questioned the word of God, because he puts himself above all. And the Roman Catholic Church, represented by the Pope, or Pope, whatever, is just the representative of Satan here in the earth. So this last sentence, for he shall magnify himself above all, very clearly states what's it really all about. Right? Well said. Okay, then I'm going to read now this... Uh, characteristic number 22, and Tom, when you uh, have something to say at a certain point, uh, then please interrupt me. We don't have to go through all the reading and analyze it then, or we do it the other way around, just uh, the way that's most suitable for you. The Vatican boldly declares in their catechism, quote, celibacy is the renunciation of marriage implicitly or explicitly made for the more perfect observance of chastity by all those who receive the sacrament of orders in any of the higher grades, end quote. And if you want to read along, there is a link here to a website that is called www.newadvent.org. That is a Catholic website. And this entire document can be found there from the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia. And you can read along with that. But um, that's a very long page. I had a short look at it. And of course, you have to be very vigilant when you read that. Because it comes, of course, from the Antichrist source. Okay, Jörg, I have a comment about this. We need to define some terms before we continue. The yeah, Roman celib Catholic... Celibacy yeah. and uh, chastity. Yeah. Yes, indeed. That's exactly where I was going. Absolutely. Maybe you would like to define, go ahead and define it. No, 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 you go ahead, but I know the importance of these words yeah. because a lot of people don't even understand it. But, of course, if you, uh, if you followed um, a few of the, um, uh, the readings that we did already on characteristics of Antichrist, um, and uh, the, the videos that I made up to now, uh, these are not in there, but uh, I, I made a few uploads on Conversation on Jogla 66, I don't know the name right now, where we went into a document that was written by a Jesuit here from Belgium, uh, and he went into the uh, 20 year of uh, education that a Jesuit priest goes through until he comes finally to the fourth vow of obedience, where he also explains this about uh, the the oath of chastity that everybody has to take. So, Tom, go along. This is really a very important point, and I think you're more eloquent to explain it than I am. So, please. Okay, we're, we're talking about two specific but different terms. Okay? Those terms are celibacy and chastity. First of all, celibacy, according to Rome's definition, according to the proper definition, the... the uh, in, the uh, dictionary des uh, the the dictionary definition of celibacy is forbidding to marry. We're talking about marriage here. Okay. Now, celib or rather, chastity is abstinence from sexual relations. They're two different things. Now, we know the Roman Catholic Church, the priests, are forbidden to marry. They must practice celibacy. That was intended by the Roman Catholic Church to enforce uh, chastity, which is abstaining from sexual relations. Now, we all know, anybody that's familiar with the Roman Catholic Church history, uh, although the priests are forbidden to marry, many of them are married, and many of them who 
uh, obey the law, the Roman Catholic canon law against celibacy, against, rather, against marriage, uh, are not chaste by any means. Okay? They do not practice chastity. They may be unmarried, but they do not practice chastity, which makes them whoremongers and which makes the women and children and men that they have sexual relations with prostitutes or, or sexual deviants, sex outside of marriage. And so the Roman Catholic Church, by doctrine, literally makes its priests violators of God's law. So by definition, the entire priestly class of the Roman Catholic Church are outside of the will of God, and this isn't an accident. The Bible makes certain that no one be mistaken about who the Antichrist is and who the synagogue of Satan is. And, uh, but it's important for the listeners to know the difference between celibacy, which is forbidding to marry, and chastity, which means abstaining from sexual relations. The second issue that I would like to bring up is it's obvious from the study of Roman Catholic Church history and the councils of the Roman Catholic Church and the papal bulls and encyclicals of the popes that the Roman Catholic Church had two very specific purposes for instituting the law of celibacy against the priest. Number one was to separate the clergy from the laity and to elevate the priesthood to a divine class. Uh, it, it creates in the minds of the, of the laity in the Roman Catholic Church a deified status for the priests. And once they are believed to be empowered by God to abstain from marriage and therefore live chaste lives, sexually deprived lives, that they have achieved a level of superiority among the laity. Now, we know what the Scripture says. That, you know, let the, let the bishops be uh, 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 married to one wife. They were supposed to be married. The Scripture is plain about this. It's not a commandment of the Lord to practice celibacy. It's a commandment of the Roman Catholic Church to practice celibacy. And the Bible plainly describes celibacy as uh, the doctrine of demons. So we don't want people uh, to be confused now, one might say, well, Paul lived a, a, a chaste life. Yes, he did voluntarily. And he never imposed uh, celibacy or chastity upon the other disciples or even the believers. Marriage is a holy institution. Marriage was created by God in the, in the Garden of Eden between Adam and Eve. The two became one flesh, and that's the proper, desirable status for men and women. Now, Paul voluntarily abstained. It was, it was his desire to serve the Lord and him only, and to not be encumbered by the cares of this life. He had a full-time job to do. He was to spread the gospel to the Gentile nations. And he was to be subjected to all kinds of terrors and dangers and shipwreck. And so it was merciful that he did not take a wife with him. But we are commanded not to observe the doctrines of devils. So what the Roman Catholic Church did was impose celibacy, the forbidding to marry upon the priests, in order, number one, to elevate them to deified status and separate them from the laity, so much so that they would regard 
the Roman Catholic priest as a divine entity above above human desires, and therefore they would receive from the priest instructions as though they came from God himself. So the priest even is described by Roman Catholic terminology as alter Christos, or another Christ. And that's how the Roman Catholic priesthood has such power over the laity. It's a very hierarchical system where you, you face excommunication if you question the authority and the teaching of the priest. Secondly, and, and probably from Rome's point of view, most importantly, uh, what celibacy did was it protected the assets of the Roman Catholic Church from pilferage, from theft. Look, if the priest is married, he's naturally not going to be chaste. He's going to engage in such natural and lawful sexual relations with his wife, and the product of that is going to be children, and possibly many children. And, of course, the priest is going to have a natural affection for his wife and his children. That's what the Bible calls natural affection. And the priest is going to want, at the time of his death, to leave some uh, inheritance for his wife and his children. And many of the priests, at a time early in the Roman Catholic Church history, before celibacy became a law in the Roman Catholic canon law, the priests were stealing from the church and then, and then given the money to their families to sustain them after his death. <clears throat> and the Roman Catholic Church was bleeding ulteriorly. I mean... <laughs> They were losing wealth. The priests were underpaid and literally starved to death. And so they stole from the Roman Catholic Church. And to stop this bleeding of the Roman Catholic Church's wealth to the priests, they simply commanded celibacy, and even the priests that were married at that time were commanded to, to put away their wives. So literally, they made their wives, you know, they pushed them out of the house. They pushed their children out of the house. They weren't allowed to have them around. And so they made the children fatherless. They made the woman uh, husbandless, made her, in effect, a widow. And her natural inclination was to uh, seek uh, the satisfaction of the natural desires of a woman. And so she lived a life of prostitution and sexual depravity. No one else would marry her. And so you see just one sin compounds another. But what really literally defines the Roman Catholic Church is sexual depravity and sexual corruption. And now it is globally recognized. It's a global pandemic that is so heinous, so hideous, that people just simply do not want to discuss it. And that's how the Roman Catholic Church still survives to this day, even in the wake of a global pedophile priest pandemic. It's just too dirty to touch. And instead of the world abandoning the Roman Catholic Church, they simply make an exception for these alter Christos, these other Christs. They're deified. And they're beyond reproach. They're sacrosanct. And so their sexual crimes continue. And since their sexual crimes are not dealt with, there's no limit to the criminality of the Roman Catholic priesthood. They're hands off. Civil law is forbidden to deal with sexually depraved priests. They are solely under the jurisdiction of the See of Rome. No civil court, without the approval of the bishop, can, can be subject to the civil authorities. The cops can't autonomously, under their own authority, break into a church and arrest a pedophile priest. They have to have the, the approval of the bishop. 
And so corruption leads to corruption. And wherever the Roman Catholic Church is powerful, she has no limit to her corruption because there are no checks against the depravity of these priests. So, uh, may, I, I, you know, I'm sorry I went on so long with this, but there are many people confused about the difference between celibacy and chastity. Yes, the Roman Catholic priests are forbidden to marry, and but they are not chaste, as the world well knows. Okay, back to you, York. Sorry to go on so long. Well, you do not have to be sorry for going on that long, because I think for most people, and even like me, it is a very interesting explanation that you just gave. And, uh, York? Yeah? Can I uh, quote uh, some scripture? That, that Tom was referring to is First Timothy uh, three two, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good be- be- behavior, given to hospi- hospi- hospitality, apt to teach. And then one more thing, uh, guest five made a comment and said, by not allowing priests to get married, the Catholic Church encourages homosexuality and child molestation. It is a very sick church, and it's just supporting what Tom has said. That's all. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, York. York. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the first points Tom made in his explanation was very interesting. He said there are 4,500 cases of Roman Catholics being involved in pedophilia cases over there in the United States right now. And the only, the first thought that came up to me is only 4,500. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's sick. It's so, it's so even. It's, uh, I understand why you laugh, Michael, but, but even there's no, nothing funny on that. But no. you have, you have to, you have to understand how high is the number of the real abuses that never see the light of day, and that will never be brought to any court anyway. Only and God knows. Only God knows, Jerk, but God does know. Of course he knows, yeah. And it also reminded me when you spoke about that they can only be prosecuted by canon law, what happened here in Belgium. Uh, you know, I, I live in Belgium since uh, almost 25 years now, and um, in the 90s we had this big scandal of Marc Dutroux, who killed some children and was... Uh, actually working for a pedophile ring, but that, of course, was suppressed uh, in, the, uh, in the aftermath of the investigation that was done on him. Twenty-seven, twenty-seven witnesses died. There were judges, there were policemen, and there were people who were speaking out for, uh, better said, against to, to, to make this case. And 27 witnesses died. He was sentenced to prison, as was his wife, Michel Martin, and Michel Martin, three years ago, was released because she put herself under canon law. Do you see what's happening here? When the civil uh, authorities are going to arrest somebody or put them into prison for something, these people have the escape route to go to the canon law to go into a monastery and be so-called free again, at least free of persecution of the people that they did these things to. Didn't something something similar happen to Charles Chinicky? Uh Wasn't he uh, falsely accused of uh, molesting a woman or having sexual? Yeah, that's, that's why that's why uh, uh, and then Abraham, later, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln became his lawyer. And he pleaded him free. And uh, when you read uh, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinicky, he writes in that book that when he was pled free and they went out of the courtroom and went down the steps from the, um, from the courthouse, um, Charles Chinicky uh, began to weep. And Abraham Lincoln asked him, I just pled you free, why are you weeping? And he said, sir, when I was in that courtroom, I saw at least 12 Jesuit priests in there, and they mm. all had written the death of you in their eyes. Mm. 
You know, Charles Chinnicky was falsely accused of uh, sexual relations, a violation of the law of, cha- uh, of chastity and uh, by the priests. And, and simply the charges were made up and brought against him because he was preaching abstinence uh, from alcohol. And, of course, I, without being, you know, being too salacious about it, I mean, uh, uh, this didn't sit well with the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, which were drunks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, 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 always, he, he also speaks in this book about uh, how they were uh, meeting in pubs and bars and drinking all night and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Alcohol, uh, alcohol abusing. Yeah, that's right. Well, he even alludes to his book that they were having drunken, drunken orgies, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, and he, you know, he he blamed all this depravity upon uh, the consumption of alcohol, and so he went on a consum- he went on a campaign against alcohol, and uh, and he kind of left unsaid. <laughs> In a manner of speaking, he didn't focus on the sexual depravity of the priest. He blamed it. He blamed it on the alcohol, and of course, these sexually celibate or or uh, the supposedly chaste priests uh, use their alcohol as a stimulant for their sexual depravity. And Charles Chinnicky tactfully went after the alcohol, and he reaped the whirlwind from the Roman Catholic priesthood because of it. And had it not been for uh, the able abilities of good old Abe Lincoln. And I say that with tongue in cheek too. I won't go into it, but uh, nonetheless, uh, were it not for the talents uh, of Abraham Lincoln and some help from God Almighty, uh, Charles Chinnicky would have been convicted because uh, the priest used uh, one of uh, one of the women, uh, one of the uh, I believe sister of one of the Roman Catholic bri- uh, bishops. Correct. To lay these false claims against uh, against Chinnicky. but as it turned out, there was a confession. Uh, some another woman, unbeknownst to the priest and this sister of the bishop, had overheard the conversation in an adjacent room, and uh, was convicted in her heart and came uh, to uh, the courtroom and testified, and uh, that she had heard it all made up and how it went down, and so uh, Abe, Abe Lincoln give, gives credit to God for freeing uh, Charles Chinnicky. But sexual depravity is, is uh, the, dis, the discussion, and uh, we just have that one example. Just from one book, there are many such examples. If one is uh, diligent to uh, study the history of the Roman Catholic Church and the priesthood and the sexual depravity, that has come from this doctrine of demons, celibacy that is imposed upon the priests. But back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And um, I think um, everybody who listens right now will see that even we cover this uh, point from uh, the characteristic of an antichrist, how he controls and um, how he controls men and will not have a desire for women. How this goes so deep that on this subject alone we could make a month-long broadcast if we take all the sources into consideration and everything that goes along with it. We were just talking about the alcohol abuse. Now think about today with the drug abuse, that when you don't even use alcohol, but you use drugs. And these drugs also uh, make a lot of people sexually violent. Maybe not cannabis, because as far as I know, uh, Cannabis just uh, relaxes you. But um, now in the United States, we see um, the last two years the legalization of cannabis. And the point is that this is only the first step. So when we would further go into that, you have to consider the opium wars that the Jesuits fought against the Chinese, how they made a whole nation addicted to drugs And opium is a much harder drug and works on another way than uh, cannabis just does. But cannabis, marijuana, opens the door. And today it is cannabis that is legal and tomorrow it is meth or opium or heroin or 
I don't know what, but it leads to the same depravity. And that's very important. But actually, as I said, if we really go deep into this, we can do a month-long broadcast only on this point when we consider all the sources that are available for us. And we don't even have all the sources. So you can imagine how deep this goes. But I will now continue reading um, the article from uh, the website uh, from Nicholas here. Absolutely every person on earth knows that the Roman Catholic priests, bishops, cardinals, and popes are not married. It is also well known that the majority of these men are gay or sodomites. For more evidence supporting this fact, see my Roman Catholic Church and Sex page in the index section of the website in the Catholicism <coughs> Exposed section of the website. This homosexual group of men are the most extreme gathering of women haters known to men. In fact, there is now documented evidence of their hatred now in writing. Mihailo Tolotos. This is probably the only healthy man in modern history who never saw the form or heard the voice of a woman. The monk Mihailo died in 1938 at the age of 82 in one of the monasteries atop Mount Athos in Greece. When his mother passed away during his birth, Mihailo was taken to Athos. Not once in his entire life did he leave his monastic colony, which for more than 900 years has strictly excluded all females, both animal and human. And you can go to the source of this if you read the book, uh, The Book of Amazing Facts, Volume 1, and this quotation came from page 69. Can you imagine the graphic hatred of these men that they would refuse an infant to ever see a woman? Can you imagine what they told this child as he grew up about women? Over the years I have heard my fair share of twisted passages and strange doctrinal opinions to confirm the celibacy of the Roman priests, but all of them fall as easy as a house of cards with one simple passage in Timothy's writing. First Timothy 3.2. Well, Michael, <laughs> you read ahead of it, like I do sometimes. Quote, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. End quote. Now I know that it is written in 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 to 9, quote, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. End quote. The apostle is telling them it is a better thing to stand alone so as to the better concentrate on their works with the Lord. Verse 32 of that same chapter confirms this. But there will always be those as verse 9 describes. They will burn with lust within themselves. Therefore, for them it is better to marry. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36 says, quote, But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she passed the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not. Let them marry. Marriage is a holy institution. The marriage bed is undefiled. These priests of Rome have corrupted the marriage bed. They have made marriage a sin, and they have made normal, God-given, holy sexual relations between a man and his wife. They have perverted it and made it filth. And uh, it, it's incredible the consequences that have resulted from the Roman Catholic Church's teaching upon marriage and human sexuality. It is incomprehensible the damage that is done, even in normal married relationships, with regards to the marriage bed. The whole world has been infected with the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church regarding the normal natural, God-given, 
holy sexual relations between a man and his wife. And uh, I can't get into the details because it's, it's, uh, it's not my purpose to do so, but the Scripture places no limitations on a natural relationship between a man and his wife, and, uh, except for one, and that was to abstain uh, during her flow, her menstrual flow. But uh, the Roman Catholic Church has corrupted the entire relationship between a man and his wife. It's, uh, it's, uh, there should be no guilt. There should be no guilt between a man and his wife. God never placed any, any, any uh, constraints on the man and his wife. He avoided the subject completely. Where there is no law, there is no sin. So a man and a woman who are married in holy matrimony are free to enjoy their God-given drives. Now, Paul is, is admonishing the widows uh, who have lost their spouses if they can abstain to do so and serve the Lord. But if they can't, it's much better to marry than to burn with lust. How can you serve the Lord if you're burning with lust? There's a natural desire. It's God-given. If one is capable to quench that desire to serve the Lord, well and good. But if one is trying to serve the Lord in ministry, as Paul did, and is burning with lust, then... By all means, according to Paul, marry. Get married. And so I, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but few people really comprehend the travesty that has been done to the marriage bed by the Roman Catholic Church through this, this idea of celibacy and chastity for the priests. I mean, if, it, if it's a holy institution for the priests, Shouldn't it be a holy institution also for the laity? And what you have as a result of that is all kinds of con uh, conflict in the household. All the better for the Church of Satan to create conflict where there never should have been conflict ever. So I'll, 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 I'll just leave it there, Yerk, and, leave, and, and turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. You know... In the beginning of this article, I cited this uh, website where you can go to uh, this Catholic website, New Advent Thoughts, something, Ark, or whatever. I do not think that 1 Corinthians 7, verse 36 will stand in that document. They only take out the pieces of the Bible that they want to, and they only take parts of verses to make their point. Because otherwise, the true word of God comes out of the Roman Catholic Church, and that is to be forbidden. So, going on. Rome denies these facts. They openly deny the sanctity of marriage. If they were to, the, to be biblical, at least some of their priests would be married, and the rest would be those that could stand alone. But since many of them are as Daniel said Antichrist will be, they truly don't desire women in the first place. It's a proven fact. The Roman Catholic priesthood is not only the largest organized group of gay or sodomite men known to men. They are also the largest known group of men that have been judged worthy of the AIDS virus. Catholic priests dying of AIDS often in silence. The annualized death rate of priests confirmed by the STAR to have died of AIDS in Kansas and Missouri from 1987 to 1999 is 7 per 10,000 or 7 times that of the general population. That death rate is consistent with the rate calculated by the STAR after reviewing death certificates of priests who died in California, Missouri and Massachusetts, Massachusetts in 1995. The finding, six priests, or 7.3 per 10,000, died of AIDS in those states that year. The, 
And the AIDS death rate of the general population in those three states in 1995 was 1.8 per 10,000. So compare that to 7.3. That's four times as high. A.W. Richard Seid, a former priest who has spent more than 30 years studying sexuality issues in the church, thinks that about 750 priests nationwide have died of such illness. That would translate into an AIDS-related death rate eight times that of the general population. Joseph Baroni, a New Jersey psychiatrist and AIDS expert, puts the number of U.S. priests who have died at 1,000 nearly 11 times the rate of the general population. Quote, and the church just doesn't want to admit it. End quote. By Judy L. Thomas, Kansas City Star, date uh, 29th of January 2000. Um, the star, this is not the star tabloid that you find in supermarkets. And for the entire article, you can go back to the index of the web page. And for more info on priests and AIDS, you can also go back and read in the index of Yes, so, so we want to make this clear. What what has been statistically discovered is that as a Roman Catholic priest, they are eleven times at greater risk for sexually transmitted AIDS than any other segment of the human population. The 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 the. Uh, the institution of the Roman Catholic priesthood is at at, at such a greater risk of of uh, homosexual or, or rather sodomite uh, death from AIDS than any other segment of the population. You're you're much greater risk of uh, contracting AIDS as a Roman Catholic priest than a drug abuser on the street than an intravenous drug user on the street. And so uh, God is making an open mockery of this Roman Catholic priesthood. There, there's no excuse for anyone not to know what the synagogue of Satan is. And this is just one statistic. There are many others, and this article will cover them. Nicholas has done his homework on this one. Back to you, Yerk. 11 times the rate of the general population of the USA? 11 times? Is this not an open and shut case, I ask? Even if none of the prophecies that openly prove this church is being controlled by Antichrist were ever to be uttered, this evidence of decadent behavior alone should be proof enough for those loyal Catholics still trapped within the walls of this church to get out now. These vile and putrid fruits of evil speak volumes unto the Christian heart that this is not the Church of Jesus Christ. Denial of this fact must end in the hearts now. This Church has been puffing up its chest, proclaiming itself, quote-unquote, another God on earth, for so long that finally it has, become, uh, it has come to a place of open and apparent judgment before the eyes of man. And according to the book of Revelation, the open evidence of evil within this church is going to get more graphic in the days to come. How long will this church of apparent evil pronounce they walk as Jesus Christ proclaimed his children should walk? How long will they torture, murder, molest, deceive, and destroy the innocent? How long shall these priests mock a mighty and ever-living God? Well, at the rate of 11 times of a national average, not much longer. So I've been exposing Rome a little over 19 years now, as of 2004. I have come across the occasional priest or layperson that has insisted that if in fact the priest sought out marriage, Rome would not object. They say that it's just that the, uh, that the priests prefer celibacy. They in fact claim marriage is holy and sacred. In fact, not too long ago, I received an article from the Roman Catholic publication named Zenit.org regarding this very fact. In this article on February 10, 2004, Roman Catholic Cardinal Edward Egan, oh, that monster I have to uh, add here, indeed, assailed the notion of homosexual marriage and criticized Hollywood for 
desecrating marriage and destroying something sacred and holy. I know this seems confusing for Rome to say in one breath that marriage is holy and sacred and in the next say that it is not for our priests. Prophetic fact is, the God of Rome is in fact the author of confusion. They seek to appear holy so as to make all, all think that they have no stake in this homosexual or sodomite agenda. In fact, what occurred quite recently has blessed me with an open and shut case on Rome's hatred of the sanctity of marriage. This cardinal lies when he said the Vatican embraces marriage, and I can now prove it. In May of 2001, Roman Catholic Archbishop Emmanuel Milingo married Korean acupuncturist Maria Sung. Reverend Sung Myung Moon officiated at the wedding. When the Vatican got wind of this, they threatened the Archbishop with excommunication if he didn't divorce that woman at once. If I'm not mistaken, they did excommunicate him so as to get his attention. This, of course, is regardless of the fact that Mark uh, chapter 10 verse 9 says, quote, What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder, end quote. Milingo held out as long as he could, but in August of that very year, he did finally renounce his marriage and left his wife behind so he could go back to Rome and, and regain his status of archbishop. This amazed more than a few people, those in and outside of Rome. The Roman Catholic Church actually forced this man to divorce his wife, even though she did not do anything worthy of divorce. How can Cardinal even say that Rome embraces marriage as something holy and sacred, and then force a man to divorce his wife because he's a priest. Does the prophetic work speak of a church as this? Again, yes. Look in First Timothy chapter 4, and you will see that in the latter days, not only will they depart from the faith and embrace doctrines of demons, they will forbid to marry. Why? Satan hates the institution of marriage. It was instituted even before sin entered the world. By the way, this is also why Satan attacks the seventh-day Sabbath. <clears throat> it too was instituted before sin entered into the world. The world, is, the world is plain. If you seek to be a pastor, you must be the husband of one wife. Yet Rome says, no way. You will ex be excommunicated from the church if you marry a woman. However, do a little research and you will find that none of the child molesters that are behind bars for molesting little boys have been officially excommunicated, not even the ones convicted last night. Yet they did commit hellish acts and were convicted of sin. Archbishop Melingo committed no sin in getting married, and he threatened with excommunication. That says a lot about Rome's true intentions toward the homosexual lifestyle. This church is not even trying to hide their homosexual tendencies at this time. In fact, they are openly lobbying in favor for men-boy love as we speak. Pedophilia advocate featured in Catholic Church Concert. The Life Site Special Report from November the 2nd, the year 2000, of Toronto. Life Site has learned that an October 27th concert at the St. Basil's Catholic Church in Toronto featured a composition by Gerald Hannon, Canada's leading advocate of intergenerational sex, or pedophilia. Hannon was part of the choir, and he was applauded separately after the piece by the musicians and those in attendance. Oh, this almost makes me cute, sorry. Hannon is one of Canada's most outspoken defenders of pedophilia. In December 1977, he published an article entitled, quote-unquote, Men Loving Boys Loving Men wherein he discussed favorably and explicitly homosexual sex acts with boys as young as seven years of age. The article led to criminal charges, but Hannon wasn't quitted. End quote from this article. This may seem shocking to some, but it appears all, <clears throat> it appears all those uh, at that Catholic concert had no problem applauding Canada's leading advocate of pedophilia. In fact, in France, we see this happen. Priest says pedophilia was good for children. This is from September the 4th, 2001. 
and there is an article from www.iol.co.za, South Africa. Aix-en-Provence, France. A Roman Catholic priest on trial in this southern French town for failing to disclose the sexual abuse of minors has argued that the pedophilic acts that took place in, the, in his parish were actually good for the children. Father Hubert Barral, 67, who heads the parish in the village of Verneg, faces up to five years in prison if convicted on a charge of failing to assist a person in danger and failing to report crime. Barral had also told one of the children that making love was a way of being in touch with God. Being in touch oh. with God. Oh, my God. Yeah, who's the God they're in touch with? The priest. Yeah. Boy, I'm getting sick reading this about the pedophilia, you know, but that's oh, because of my... That's because of my personal background, because my mm-hmm. wife left me for a pedophile some years. It's incredible. With all this in mind, I would also like for you to keep in mind all the pedophilia lawsuits that are popping up all over the world against Roman Catholic priests. In fact, it's gotten so bad that a gag order was placed on the media regarding these lawsuits. Why? Common sense. If the Catholic people knew just how bad it really was, they would have to close a lot more than just 80 churches in the Boston area, like they had to do recently. All this legal activity is causing such a drain on the Vatican's finances that it is obvious they are in trouble. They know that this that if this continues much longer, they will be shut down permanently. So, what can they do? Either lessen the dollar amounts on the lawsuits or get them to drop altogether? The answer is, in fact, legalizing homosexual marriages. That's right. I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to stop. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, 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 I turned off my mic. That wasn't the, the intention. Okay. <laughs> I, sorry. I, I have to. I have to really go deeper into this right now because when you look, they're all over the world. The civil um, authorities right now welcome with open arms all the gay people because the Pope says when somebody is gay. And he thinks it's right. Who am I to judge? Well, just look at this. We have had this case of the lawyer, uh, lawyer, the mayor, uh, which is a lesbian woman in Houston, who was uh, uh, going to the priest, and they had to make all the sermons open to her because they were preaching against homosexuality, of course. So there you have already the mingling which, uh, of the church and the state, right? Well, it's worse would, than that, Jorg. I mean, I would, I would, yeah, sorry. I would really like to go deeper into this. So by this, Michael, please, and Tom, please well, go into this, because this is a subject that we really need to attend a little bit deeper than already written in this wonderful article after here. But I'm getting sick of all the pity to take a break well, for minutes. You know, you know like this, this week, you know, it's, although I couldn't find one, for some reason at the beginning of the show, but I mean, there are literally dozens, maybe even hundreds of articles this week concerning his private meeting with a trans- transsexual and his fiance in the Vatican. How many people even get a private meeting with the Pope? Why did he choose, of all things, a transsexual? It's a man or woman. I think it was a woman who was confused and uh, decided to become a man, but I'm not 100% sure which way it was. But regardless of that, why are they supporting this? Why are they supporting this perversion? It doesn't make... uh, The only thing I can think of is that they're basically... He's coming out of the closet, if you will. They're trying to make it easier for them to come out of the closet. I don't know. What do you think? Well, there, there's certainly the Roman Catholic Church for its entire history has ha- had to deal with the sexual depravity of the priests almost since the very beginning of the Roman Catholic Church through, through their councils and 
uh, executive sessions after the councils continually having to deal with the the charges against the priests for sexual misconduct. And it all comes from an understanding of Romans chapter 1. It's the church of idolatry, therefore it is the church of sodomy. And it has been uh, a, a, a permanent a permanent institution within the Roman Catholic Church. Pedophilia, sodomy, every other kind of sexual perversion. And it, Rome, it's gotten to the point where Rome can't cover it up because it's too well known. And they can't put it back in the box because it's a divine recompense from God. So the, since they will not acknowledge the the cause of all this sexual depravity, idolatry, and, and, and celibacy, since there is no repentance in the Roman Catholic Church, they simply have to mainstream sodomy in society so that their priests no longer stand out to the world as an exception, as a diabolical exception. They just scatter the disease all over the world. And so therefore, the priests are no longer scandalized when there are homosexual marriages legalized, or sodomy is practiced in the streets, just like it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Look, we, we've talked about Sodom and Gomorrah in the video that's available. Uh, I can't remember. Ron Wyatt traveled to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he saw in the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah all these statues, these images and idols that were worshipped in Egypt. He found them also in, in, you know, in, in a state of destruction after the conflagration from heaven. But what, because of their idolatry, they were reduced to sodomy. When they corrupted God's body with man-made images and idols and then bowed down and worshipped them, God visited upon them the divine recompense. That since they had a, an, un, an unholy uh, uh, view of God, he gave them an unholy view of themselves, and they, they, depraved, they, they corrupted themselves just like they corrupted God. They corrupted their own bodies through sodomy. And so sodomy was mainstreamed in Sodom and Gomorrah. They couldn't do anything about it. It was, a, it was a divine recompense for idolatry. And they couldn't hide it because everybody were, you know, the vast percentage of the population in Sodom and Gomorrah were sodomites. So they had to mainstream it. And, and they just had to give it, a, you know, it was an alternative lifestyle. You've heard that used to describe uh, sodomy. And so it was practiced openly in the streets even so much so that when, when Jesus set the, sent the angels to deliver Lot and his wife and family uh, uh, from, from Sodom and Gomorrah before the, before the destruction, that the Sodomites even tried to molest the angels. And that's exactly where we are today. And it, we're only there because we failed to understand the true root of the depravity in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was idolatry. And until the Roman Catholic Church deals with its idolatry, it will have sodomite priests. And since they cannot recognize and will not recognize the cause for their, their unholy uh, lusts and desires for images and idols, and their priests likewise de uh, uh, desecrate themselves, then the only alternative is to legalize sodomize, sodomy and make it legal all over the world. And so now we have a global Sodom and Gomorrah, simply because the Roman Catholic Church is the church of idolatry. Because it is the church of idolatry, it is the church of sodomy. And because the, the world will not force the Roman Catholic Church to deal with this plague, They've allowed sodomy to become mainstream and legally acceptable. We're, we're faced with a global Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and people just won't acknowledge or comprehend the very root of sodomy is idolatry. 
you can't, no doctor can give a diagnosis or a treatment for sodomy. No psychologist, no other professional medical or psychiatric institution can place a, 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 uh, a diagnosis or a prescription for this unnatural act. And so it has simply has, they won't acknowledge that its cause is idolatry, so they simply have to mainstream it. I, I don't know how many other ways I can say it. it. It's so clear in my mind, but yet it's so hard to convey to other people. And it's only because they don't understand Romans chapter 1. God is clearly laying forth the, the fact that if one reduces God's body to a man-made image and idol and then bows down and worship it, then God reduces them to a like depravity. It's sodomy. It's, it is the characteristic of the Antichrist church. It's, it's one of the major things that identifies the Antichrist church. It's a sodomite church. And it won't repent. It won't renounce its idolatry. Therefore, the, the sodomy is a, is a permanent fixture in the Roman Catholic Church. It has now gained the, the, the notoriety of the whole world. So the only answer is to mainstream it. So there's no more condemnation of the Roman Catholic priests. Now we have a global Sodom and Gomorrah. I've repeated myself three times. I hope maybe it's sinking in to the listeners. I'll tell you what, I've talked about this subject on amateur radio. And the, and the overwhelming rejection of the, the entire concept. They do not want to hear what the Bible has to say. Hey, Tom. So yeah. What was the name of that book that you read on your show that was dealing with this subject? It was a pretty harsh book. I remember I could only listen to a couple episodes. It was so sickening to me, but it was talking about, I think it was talking about through the confession itself and how they used that to exploit. Well, The Priest, The Woman, and The Confessional by Charles Chinnicky. Okay, is that it? He admits in his book that the confessional of the Roman Catholic Church is the place where... Uh, the priest who is required to be celibate and chaste is put in a, in, in, a, in a small confinement called the confessional box with the door closed, and a woman is to confess all of her secret sins to the priest. And if she doesn't do so willingly, then the priest has to ask certain questions. Yes. And, and then admonishes her, that he cannot give her penance and he cannot absolve her of her sins unless she gives a full confession. And so the priest literally sits there in the confessional booth in private with this woman or this young girl and where she opens up her heart to the most secret areas of her life. And that's where the lust becomes impossible to contain. And this is where the priest becomes a monster and preys upon these vulnerable women and children and violating the sexual privacy of young girls and married women. And it's just, it's, it's an abomination. The power that the Roman Catholic priest has over the woman of the Roman Catholic Church, and it leads to every kind of sexual depravity. Yeah. Common sense, to listen, common sense dictates that if a young girl who is just coming to her sexual age has to confess to a sex-starved priest all of her secret imaginings, all of her mental sins. The priest can't stand it. And that young child becomes the object of his lust. There's your pedophilia. It all happens in the confessional box. And it was attested to by Roman Catholic priest Charles Jenicky, and he's only one of thousands of Roman Catholic priests who have condemned the confessional box of the Roman Catholic Church as a root and cause of so much sexual depravity 
among these celibate priests, among these idolatrous priests. And uh, likewise, the little boys are brought into these confessional boxes with these priests. And they're told, they're given instructions of what questions to ask these little boys if they don't come forth with their sexual desires and their sexual mental sins or, you know, imaginings. And uh, likewise, uh, look, it, it's, 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 it's much easier for a Roman Catholic priest to pray on little children because they, the children look up to the priests as, as representatives of God himself. And they hold these priests in a, in a position of deity in their, in their minds. And so if the priest touches them in a certain way and says it's holy, then they have to yield to it. And if it comes to the point after years of molestation, which began in the, in the confessional box and continues outside of the confessional box, in in the in the in the form of uh, of uh, excursions, boys going on trips with the priests, and that sort of thing. Yeah. If if one of the if one of these boys becomes convicted in his heart about this this unholy thing that's happening, and and and, and starts to go public, the priest can simply say, "Look, uh, if you go forward with this, I will no longer." Oh. Not again. Oh, no. What happened? Uh, something happened. You there, Tom? Can you hear us? Uh-oh. I'm, I'm still here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I mean, can you hear me? I think it'll pop. It looks like they're trying to, uh, this guy's trying to get him back in. Yeah, it's like, you know, what it, you know what it reminds me of? Like some whacked out dude that spends his day watching porn on the Internet. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like it's like the roots and the foundation of it all came from the Catholic priests, yeah. pornography, you know. And uh, you there, Tom? I'm back. Yeah, okay. I'm back. I don't know why we're having connection problems today, but look, it's always you know, you don't know when you know the subject, you know why we have connection problems. Yeah, sure. It, it's 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 largely misunderstood by the non-Catholic world uh, how much power and influence the priests have over the confessors, over the children, over the women, and the vulnerable in the Roman Catholic Church. And they have no idea where this pedophilia starts. It, it's the confessional box. Yeah. And uh, uh, this, this is another sin. You don't confess your sins to a man. You don't confess your sins to any man, whether you be the priest or the pope. You confess your sins to the one who can absolve you of your sins, the one who died for you, Jesus Christ himself. And... Uh, uh, this is the uh, the Church of Antichrist. It, 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 it's, there's no doubt about it. And we're only touching on one aspect, one characteristic of Antichrist. And, and like Yerk said, we could talk about this subject for a month and never exhaust this subject. Well, I have a question for you, Tom. When it comes to the Bible, uh, Revelation is 11.8, and it talks about... Uh, you know, and the dead bodies that were lying there in the streets of the great city, which spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Is that Rome? I mean, Rome certainly sounds like Sodom and Egypt to me, but I may not be wrong about that, but I know others might say it's Jerusalem, but uh, at the time, Rome was occupying Jerusalem, and it was their city, and uh, it seems like what we're talking about is Sodom and Egypt here. Well, we got we have to go back and understand what characterized Sodom and Egypt. First, there was idolatry. Mm -hmm. And then there was sodomy, uh -huh. the divine recompense. And, and, and what we're talking about now is, is a global idolatry. The new world order is simply the restoration of the old world order. True. The old world order of the dark ages when the Pope ruled supreme over the people and over the kings of the earth. The new world order is the same thing now, reborn. 
So we have a global idolatry taking place. We have all the once Protestant churches now ecumenically reuniting and going home to the mother church of Rome. We've got a global Sodom and Gomorrah going on here now, a spiritual Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember the scripture says spiritually Sodom and Egypt. Right. What characterized Sodom and Egypt? It was idolatry. So we have a global reverence for this false god in Rome, and we have a, a global uh, 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 dispensation of doing away with God's holy immutable uh, uh, law and accepting Roman Catholic canon law as the law of the world, the law of the land. That's what the new world order is. It's exactly re of the recreation of the old world order. Global Sodom and Egypt, it's characterized by idolatry. Mm -hmm. and, and the open evidence of it, of, of God's divine judgment, is this, this, this sodomite pandemic that is breaking out all over the world. I mean, you can't even watch a television show without a sodomite being the central character. It's true. I mean, every, every television program now is centered around a homosexual, a sodomite. Whether they be male or female, it's just, they're mainstreaming it. What we're seeing is the judgment of Almighty God. The only the only thing left to happen is the fire and brimstone raining down from heaven. So and so I you know where our Christ was crucified was Jerusalem. But what characterized Jerusalem? They fell out of favor with God because they bowed down and worshipped images and idols. It's true. So. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but sure you I did. Mean, yeah. All right. You did a great job. So. Yeah, it's really disturbing what we're witnessing. Look, you know, look it's, a, it's a frantic situation. Yeah. It's a frantic situation. And we're not talking about just the destruction of the Roman Catholic Church, which we would all applaud if God would finally do as he <laughs> promised and destroy that. But what we fail to realize is if, he, if he's going to destroy the Roman Catholic Church for its idolatry and its sodomy, what is he going to do to the ecumenical churches that once knew the truth? What will their judgment be? This is a frantic situation. Yeah. You're right. Absolutely right. Well, we did spend a lot of time now about sodomy and so-called homosexuality <clears throat> and how uh, at the end of my reading, legalizing homosexual marriage is, is in fact the answer that the Roman Catholic Church has. Uh, we did a little bit go into the uh, pedophilia subject. And I just want to add something there because this is a movement that started out in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland last year. And uh, it is a fact. Now, hold on to your seats, brothers. It is a fact that in the school curriculum in the German state of Baden-Württemberg that is based on the Kinsey Report. Do you get that? Absolutely, I get it. The Kinsey Report. Oh, and, gosh, yeah. And you have, to understand, you have to understand that legalizing homosexual marriages is only the first step because when people accept that, they will also accept pedophilia afterwards. And this is the worst that can happen. And they started the last year already, or the year before, and I have some videos uploaded on that uh, in German on my second YouTube channel, Douglas War on Disinfo, about the early sexualization of our children. And that also includes the children sent to the kindergarten between the ages four and six years old are being taught to undress each other and to touch each other everywhere on the body, even in the private parts. That also includes the so-called sexual education and using porn movies when the children are 12 and 13 years old. There are parents in Germany, and that is documented by video, that have been sent to prison 
because their child of 10 years old, a, uh, a girl from 10 years old, left the sexual education lesson because she couldn't stand it. And of course, these people were, you guessed, Christians, not Catholics, Christians, who told that child, if you cannot stand that, if you cannot go along with the teaching in the school, then just walk out of the class. She did. Her father was fined. He didn't pay the fine because he thought, and of course he is correct in that, it is not correct to pay a fine for something like that. And then he was imprisoned. And after he was in prison, they went after his wife, seven months pregnant, and wanted to imprison her too. And then they came back later, after she gave birth, and she was still breastfeeding, and they wanted to arrest her again and put her into prison. This is going on in Germany right now. This is going on in Austria right now, and this is going on in Switzerland right now. And as a little advice to you Americans, I will say Google and check out Common, Common, Common Core, it's called. The Common Core teaching that is implemented now all over the United States deals with the same thing. But in Germany, they use the Kinsey Report as basis for their sexual education. And if you do not know what the Kinsey Report is, Google it. Let's make sure they know how to spell it. The Kinsey Report. K I N S E Y. Yeah. K I N S E Y. What it really is boils down to, when it comes to sexuality, there are no rules. And as a matter of fact, if you try to place some restraint on little children with regard to their sexual lives, you are the criminal. And the fact of the matter it was, was known, if there were any righteousness in this country, if there was any respect for God's law, if there were any respect for children, the people of this country would march on all the public schools and close them down. But you don't see that anywhere in this country. There's no march against these schools to teach this sexual depravity, this sodomy, and every kind of sexual offense in the schools. No one cares because they care not for God's word nor his law. Yeah, that's right, Tom. I didn't know when we started this characteristic number 22 that it would make me sick as it does right now. But still, I think we have the obligation to continue. So I'm going to continue reading. The answer is, in fact, like I said earlier already, legalizing homosexual marriages. Okay, okay. Some of you may be thinking, huh? Did you just say homosexual marriage is going to help Rome out of this mess? Yes. That's exactly what I said. Before homosexual marriage, you had lawsuits that are legally very offensive. But with homosexual marriage, you opened the door to a BD perversion that the laws of the land can accept and allow for some leeway. Case in point is what happened in Canada recently. I reported in a few truths provided audio clips that you can find in the index of the website back in June and July of last year that Rome needs to push the homosexual agenda forward so, so as to help them out of this looming financial disaster. Since the Roman Catholic scandal regarding the vulgar and sickening act of child molestation, I have noticed a, polit a political blitzkrieg in the media regarding homosexuality. Articles on almost every topic concerning the homosexual lifestyle have flooded the media. Directly after Canada allowed homosexual marriages, I reported in an audio clip that we should be watching Rome and the pedophilia problem more closely now. Thing is, as usual, Rome will get her problem fixed by hiding behind governing officials doing the dirty work. This is how the Inquisition worked. This is how Hitler worked. This is how the U.S. government has been working it lately as well. Case in point, less than a week after the homosexual marriage announcement in Canada, you saw this occur in the United States of America. 
victims angered and upset by ruling freeing, freeing molesters. July the 12th of the New York Times by John M. Broder, Los Angeles, July 12th. George Neville Rucker, an 82-year-old former Roman Catholic priest, was on a two-month cruise off the Aleutian Islands in Alaska when, the authorities said, his past finally caught up with him. But this week, before every, any evidence was presented to a jury, Mr. Rucker walked out of court a free man. He is among perhaps hundreds of people in California who are being freed from trial or jail as a result of a United States Supreme Court ruling on June 26, overturning a 1993 California law that allowed charges against child molesters protected by a previous deadline on prosecutions. State officials said the decision affected as many as 800 people accused of sexual offenses or already convicted. The ruling and the release of the offenders had infuriated victims and frustrated prosecutors. Quote, we are still licking our wounds here, unquote, said William Hodgman, head of the Sexual Crimes Unit of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. Quote, conservatively, we have over 200 impacted cases in LA County alone, with the prospect of it going higher. And that's 200 cases of Roman Catholic priests pedophilia in one county and the way they were getting the priests out of trouble the court simply imposed a statute of limitations that if the abused child doesn't come forward within a certain period of time the priest gets by with his crime scot-free he added quote without question there will be established child molesters free from custody and allowed to go back into the communities from whence they came. End quote. So you see how the courts, that is the civil law, is protecting these pedophile priests by simply putting a, a statute of limitations on the, on the victims. Look, let's say it's a seven-year-old child or even a 13-year-old boy, an altar boy in the Roman Catholic Church. He becomes the victim of a sexual pedophile, a Roman Catholic priest. He is debauched repeatedly. His life is destroyed. Any normal perception of human sexuality has been completely destroyed. The kid's life is destroyed. Here we have a man who calls himself the Vicar of Christ, an altar Christos, is doing the most diabolical molestation of this little boy he's ashamed of himself he wants to hide from the world he wants many of them commit suicide but the courts say if they don't bring their case to the courts within a re certain period of time they lose the case the court won't hear it so how do you get a seven-year-old or a 13-year-old altar boy to go to the police about his molestation when a seven-year-old or a 13-year-old just wants to crawl in a corner and die. You see, there's, they've completely eliminated the threat. That's why the priests prey on little children, because the little children can be threatened. The little children <coughs> want to keep that secret. And it's only until they become 30, 40, 50, 60 years old or come down with a, uh, a, a, a terminal disease, and they've got nothing left to lose, may, may, many times 30 or 40 years after the crime, then they're, then they're willing to come forward and talk about it publicly. The courts say, sorry, the statute of limitations is up. That's how they protect the priests. The civil law of this country, the federal government of this country, protects the sodomite priests. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I will continue reading the article because we are almost done with characteristic number 22 and then we can discuss this whole subject uh, again in our own words, but just going to continue reading Nicholas' article here. Can anyone see what is transpiring here? Absolutely every person in the United States of America that has access to a television, a radio, the internet, or even a newspaper knows 
that the Roman Catholic Church is the sole beneficiary of such a horrendous law as this. Only Rome will benefit by this. Sure, some pedophiles that are non-Catholic priests will be released from prison, and we can solely thank Rome for that. But it's truly Rome that will be blessed by this. Literally thousands of lawsuits across this nation prove that beyond a doubt. Well, we spoke about the 4,500 there in the beginning. Yes, those are realistic figures. You will have to be literally dead or in a coma to miss this simple reality. The largest organized group of child molesters is in fact Roman Catholic priests, just as Daniel's prophecy predicted. Please pray for them, because the fact of the matter is plain. They probably don't even know they are an error, let alone dangerous. End of the reading. It leaves one speechless. Yeah, that's why I couldn't say something for a moment. It leaves one speechless. And you, and you see that, and, and, and you know, you all know that I live in Belgium, right? Yeah. And I couldn't think of a country being more under the yoke of Rome, being more Catholic than this country. And when I go out to my clients, and they have children, and they say with proud in their voice, well, I'm going to look for a good Catholic church for my child to attend. Every time I leave that client, I leave weeping. Whether I made a sale or I didn't, because I see how wrongly informed these people are, how blind these people are to the truth. At the end of last year, there were some headlines in, in the Belgian newspapers. I, I don't read them, but sometimes when I go into the supermarket or something, then they sell newspapers and something, sell newspapers and sometimes then I see the headlines. And for a week or two, that was full with uh, Roman Catholic priests from the city of Bruges and uh, that part of uh, Flanders where I live in, where there again a pedophile ring of Catholic priests had been uh, dismantled and put out in the open. And people buy the newspapers and they read it, and the next day they send their child again to the Roman Catholic Church. And worst of all, to the Roman Catholic-led school, to all these Catholic schools that we have here. When I came to Belgium and I wasn't a believer in Jesus Christ, I attended a uh, high school here, uh, a college here, um, that is called um, Heilig Hart, Sacred Heart. That's Roman Catholic, and um, that has a kindergarten, that has an elementary school um, that goes up all the way to the high school and even the college, all under the same roof. I wasn't aware of that. But today I have to say to myself, well, and you even attended a school like that. Uh, today I'm, I'm very pleased that I uh, didn't uh, finish the three years because I quit after two for reasons that I'm not... <clears throat> that I don't have to tell here right now with nothing to do with belief system or whatever, but I'm glad that I didn't get a degree on that, <laughs> on that and I can show for today. But uh, when, when you see this abomination, and of course you in the United States of America, you have less Catholics uh, or less Catholic infiltration than we have here, but you have all the apostate Protestant churches and they are as bad as Roman Catholic. They are just Roman Catholic under another veil. So, um, for anyone, like um, our guest in the chat room says, he is a former Catholic who attended parochial school for many years. He probably has his eyes opened. I hope, at least I pray for that, that he has his eyes opened by reading this characteristic number two of, uh, number 22 of the Antichrist and understands how deceived all the people are and when you attended a Catholic school when you were a child, I don't see any reason why you should put your, your child, when you are a parent right now, into the same peril that you have gone through. 
course not every child is being molested by attending these schools, but even the children that are molested don't mostly mostly don't even speak about uh, speak about that because they are ashamed. They have been molested. They have been taken advantage of, and um, very often they don't speak about that. They don't speak about that with their parents. They don't speak about that with their friends because they are ashamed and they have no way to turn to except, of course, the priest. And then they go into what Tom said, the confession box. And there it starts to get really bad. So if you're a parent that cares for his child, you shouldn't send them to any Catholic school anyway. I think I'm just rambling on here, but you know. Oh, you can't you know. send it. You can't send them to a public school either, because they're teaching this antichrist doctrine yeah, in, in the public schools. And if you don't send your child to the sodomite public schools, where they can learn every kind of sexual de- uh, deviancy, then you're arrested. You know, they started this nonsense back in the early 1970s. I was about to get married. And it came out on the national and international news. It was, it was talked about all the time uh, in the news that children were going to be given rights to sue their parents if the parents used corporal punishment or any, any other kind of correction. And, and I had to make a decision, even at the very time when I was thinking about getting married and having children, that I had to think, that if I do this, if I get married and have children, I'm not going to be able to raise up my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord as is commanded of every Christian man. And that my children were not going to have to submit to my authority nor the teachings of the Scripture, but that they were going to have to submit to the teachings of the pedophile, sodomite, Roman Catholic Church controlled public schools, and if I did anything against it, I would be sued by my child. I would be sued by the schools. I would be placed in prison. And I knew that if I had children, I would be in prison because I would not allow any school teacher to teach my child at the age of, of, of seven or eight years old what sodomy is. I would not allow a public institution like the public school system to introduce to to my child the same things that the Roman Catholic priesthood are supposed, are forced to, to, to subject the little children in the confessional box. Well, Tom, um, this brings us a little bit back to um, one of the earlier broadcasts that we had, but I made the latest video on. The Externalization of the Hierarchy, Part 2, where you were a part of reading the Ten Satanic Commandments from Ellis Bailey from her book, The Externalization of the Hierarchy, promoted by the United Nations, um, where the first point was get God out of the education system, and where the second point was to enforce excessive child laws. Yep. Now it now, when you, when you follow the whole broadcast here on nothing but the truth, then you will not only see the silver lining, but you will see the line that combines all the points that we are talking in all the broadcasts, that it all puts together. That is not a conspiracy theory. That is a Roman Catholic Church conspiracy fact. Yep. And, they and, and look, if people if they turn away every time they hear the word conspiracy, let's describe it what it really is. It's a confederacy. It's a confederacy of the Roman Catholic Church with all of her harlot daughters, and they are destined to destroy Christ on, and any evidence of his teachings and doctrines in this world. And they've succeeded. Look, you, we all have to admit, you, Michael, Yerk, myself, not many people are going to be interested in the material we're presenting in this in this in this uh, program. 
And certainly those who are pricked in their conscience about the things that we're talking about won't be motivated to do anything about it. That's, that's how, what you, that's you, that's how what you when you said uh, you have to be spiritually or, or what was it, um, intellectually honest. Yes. Most people aren't. Yeah. Because facing the truth hurts. It hurts when you are 30, 40, 50 years old and then somebody comes and smacks you with the truth and you have to see and you have to admit to yourself that you have been living a lie up to that day. Yeah. That hurts. But I'd rather be slapped with the truth in my face once than being kissed by a lie all my life. Characteristics of Antichrist. This is only one of them. Yeah. Can you believe it? We only spent again two hours on one point, and even then we haven't gone into the whole depth of it. No. We're just scratching the surface. We are just seeing the tip of the iceberg of this one little point. Yeah. In the words of J. Edgar Hoover, who said that humanity is faced with such a conspiracy so big that he cannot conceal it, he cannot conceive it, he cannot understand it, makes more and more sense the deeper you go into these studies. All of you out there, all of you listening now, all of you listening in the future, get a grip. You have been lied to from the beginning, from the very beginning. And if you have no common sense to ask questions, then you will never come to the truth. The truth that lies in our Savior, Jesus Christ, he cannot save us from this life here, but he can make sure that when you walk in his way, that you can live a life that makes you worth of eternal life with him. And that is so much more precious and so much more worthful than everything that this world has to offer. Praise the Lord. Don't forget Praise that. Lord. Take out your Bible. The AV 1611, King James Bible in English. The only true conserved word of God that we have today. Read it online. Buy a copy. I don't care. But get to it. Study the Bible. Only when you study the Word of God, you can identify the lies of Antichrist, as we are doing here with this reading of this uh, document from Nicholas from Lament of God. If you don't let Jesus into your life, you let Satan into your life. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm almost out of words here. I, I likewise... Believe right. it or not, Tom Fress is left speechless. <laughs> well, that's understandable. It's a very heavy topic, and it's one that's very disturbing, and it's a, a reality. And uh, it is important to uh, discuss and, and shine the light on it, expose the wickedness that's out there. And uh, the answer, as we just mentioned, as, as your, your has mentioned, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are all sinners. We need a Savior. Our Savior is Jesus Christ. And um, we put our faith in Him. And uh, what we are witnessing as well when we talk about this is it's prophecy and it is predict, prophesied by our our Lord and Savior that this was what this time would be like. So, And it is important for us to talk about this. And this is not about gossip. And anybody who's listening to us, I hope you're doing this for the right reasons, and that is to arm yourself with the truth so that you can share that with others. But this is not about gossip. This is not some, you know, we're passing an hour or two or three just uh, for our own kicks. This is something that we have been called to do. And for those who are listening, please. Learn what you can about this and, and pass it on. And um, hopefully you recognize the importance of this message. And 
that's all I can say about that. So uh, I do appreciate you gentlemen being here. And uh, uh, it is, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough matters. It's tough issues to actually talk about. It's not unpleasant. I mean, if you have any light of Christ in you, you're going to be very disturbed by all this. And it should make you sick to your stomach. But it needs to be talked about. And there's going to be somebody that's going to come in your life that you're going to, you know, uh, it's going to need to hear this. And you need to know the truth so that you can share it out with them, share it with them, or at least, you know, have them come to this show and listen. And then there's we're not getting any we're not getting anything out of this as far as monetary gain or the things of this world. We're just doing our best is what we been called to do to serve our Lord. So now, worse than that, I'm destitute poor because of this. Well. I'm right there with you, so none of us are making a dime off this. So. Um, but, you know, that's not the reason why we're doing it. We're doing it because we have faith in Jesus Christ. Our Lord the reward Lord. will be paid in heaven. Yeah. And uh, what, more can we make, what more can a man do? And uh, this, is our, this is our call, and this is what we're supposed to do. And... Uh, if somebody wants more than this, well, they certainly can start their own show now, can't they? And they can do it. <laughs> well, they can start joining us on the live calls. Yeah. Joining us on the recordings or joining us on watching the videos that I upload from these recordings on my Juggler 66 uh, YouTube channel. And I hope that it will get a lot of views from people who understand. Yeah. But, uh, it's heavy. You, know, you heavy. have to... You have to armor yourself. Uh, you have to arm yourself with the armor of God. And the armor of God is His Word. That is the only truth that you will find in this diabolical world. The Word of God, still preserved in the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. That's the only truth you will ever find in this world. There is no other. You can stop watching Alex Jones. David Icke, Red Pill, Channels, I don't know what. The truth is never to be found anywhere else than the true word of God. And yeah. whether you open yourself to it or you don't, that's up to you personally, up to every person himself. We cannot force anybody to do that, and we won't, because, you know, Christians are pacifists. We don't push anybody in the face. We don't give anybody a rifle or whatever to go into somebody else. Our armor is the word of God. That is a sword that our Savior will bring when he comes for the second time. So make sure, make very sure that you will understand the real second coming of Jesus Christ and not being deceived by this whole seven-year tribulation, pre-trip rapture, mid-trip rapture, post-trip rapture. That's all not biblical. The rapture has been canceled. Check Nicholas Arthur on that. Michael invited him, I think, twice already to this show here. And his website, I think, uh, what's it called? Cross the Border. Cross the Border. Yeah, Cross the Border. Study that. Study remnantofgod.org, the website that we were reading from here, and study your Bible. Study your Bible and get ready. Because we are not fighting against flesh and people. We are fighting against what it said. Principalities and powers, powers and powers and rulers and high places. And rulers and high places. Satan and, and all his minions. And don't fear the one who takes your bodily life. Fear the one that takes your soul. And with this, I want to stop my broadcast for today. Thank you very much, everybody. I, I want to say bless you, and uh, yeah, of course, you always have the finishing words, but these are just my finishing words. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thanks for attending. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you soon with again another uh, 
are probably characteristic number 23 of the Antichrist. We will go on there, and in the meantime, check to get the Bible, read it, um, and read it with, a, with an open heart, and let the truth come into you. And then you will see how deceived the world is that you have been living up to now. So thank you, very, everybody. Thanks very much. God bless you. And until the next time. Bye-bye. Right. And so it's and also as far as uh, the comment about uh, bummer that Martin Luther didn't get to enjoy the true Bible or Calvin or uh, Ziggy or whatever it is. Uh, I can't pronounce that. Whatever. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that we're talking about the English Bible, the English translation. Martin Luther was German. Come on, just don't be so petty about things and fight about things that are ridiculous. You know, what was the best tra- English translation that we have at this point? Uh, you know, yeah, it's the English, you know, it's the King James Bible. Hey, if you want to use the Geneva Bible, great. But it's, you know what? Go to BibleHub.com yourself and compare the, the King James Bible to all the other translations and discern, determine for yourself. This is not some, we're not some, you know, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, it's just fanatical whack job to say, you know, it's King James Bible, that's all for uh, some unknown reason. And the reason why we say this is because we have, at least I know I have, and for I was just talked to uh, Jurgen and, and Tom, we see the same thing, that uh, we understand, we've seen, we don't need anybody else to tell us. We've actually done our homework, and we know that the translations past King James Bible are a mess, mixed bag of messages and deception. The Jesuits have been involved. There's a reason why we push the King James Bible, because that is easily accessible to any man who speaks English. You still have that opportunity to get it, and that's the reason why we push it. If everybody else wants to make a comment, they, they certainly can. But this whole thing about you know knocking the fact that we use the King James Bible and saying stuff like Martin Luther, too bad he didn't get it. Come on, he's German. He was around before the thing that was ever even written. If you want to get all petty about things, that's your that's your business. But you know what? We're trying to share with people the truth of what's going on in this world. And if you don't speak enough about the gospel according to you. You have every right to come on the show and do it. Start your own show. Why are you even listening? Is it just the past time? Is it gossip power? Is it the same thing as what you, we experienced growing up on television? Come on. Why are you here? We're doing this not because we get anything out of it, except that we have been called to do this to expose the Antichrist that most people don't know who it is, who he is, what it is. If you already know that, why are you here? Why aren't you sharing it with everyone else you can? Start your own show. It doesn't take that much effort. You better join us. But you know, this whole thing about fighting and bickering, but the most petty of things is ridiculous. And with that, God bless you all, and thank you for the show, gentlemen, and have a good night, or good day. Thank you.